This video is actually a one hour cut of a full four hour tutorial of QuickBooks Online that I use to teach other accountants how to use QuickBooks Online from A through Z. This specific video focuses on bank feeds or downloaded transactions, where you connect your bank, download transactions, you categorize them, and then you use something called bank rules to automate that categorization. You will also notice in the video that I go back and forth between the banking and the reports, so you can start seeing the consequences that the work you're doing in banking actually has in your profit and loss and your balance sheet. Now, I wanna ask you for a favor. If you actually like this type of long form content, one hour plus type of tutorials, put in the description below, put in the, in the comments below why you like that or the fact that you prefer these type of tutorials versus the typical five to 20 minute tutorials that you get to see from most creators in QuickBooks. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel as I'm uploading a lot of tutorials for QuickBooks Online. My goal is to give you the most pleasant experience by using QuickBooks and doing your own accounting. Once again, subscribe to the channel, put comments below. My email is somewhere on the screen and it should be on the description as well. And I hope you enjoy. Let's get started with QuickBooks Online Banking and Bank Rules. We'll talk about some tips on how to work uh, quickly with bank feeds. So number one, obviously X out any, any pop-ups. I personally like to collapse to close those bank cards. We can collapse the left navigation bar. And then you want to get uh, intimately um, acquainted with the uh, control plus and control minus buttons. So control plus and control minus. Command plus, command minus on the Mac will uh, allow you to zoom in and out. So as you zoom in and out, you get to, uh, you get to choose you know, what font size, what, uh, you know, how much of the screen each of these things are going to take. I'm going to work in 150% zoom for the purpose of, uh, of, of the webinar. Most people are going to be working on 100% or 125. So one thing that kind of irks me about this screen is about 30% of the screen is sort of wasted in the top on this header stuff. If I scroll up and, may and maybe get all the way to where the filters show up in all transactions, maybe have 80% of the screen. This is probably as good as it's going to get. Now, these transactions are sorted by date. If I click on date one more time, then they're, they're going to be sorted in descending order. If I click on description, they will be sorted in description. If I click on payee, they'll be sorted based on, in this case, blanks or payees that QuickBooks has already um, recognized. So these are payees that you have in your QuickBooks Online. Keep in mind that sometimes it's wrong. Like in this case, it thought Zaxby's was Zapier. That's wrong. So you have to take these matching elements with a grain of salt. This is why the, the creating the rules is so important, which we'll discuss. And you also notice that there's already a category in some of these. Some, some are might be close to accurate. Some are going to say uncategorized. Some are going to say rule next to it. That means that a rule has already been applied. You're going to see uh, spent and received. These two columns, if I click on the gear menu and click on where it says show amounts in one column, that's where I toggle. And I only want to see positives and negatives. Up to you, really, if you want to look at it this way. It's going to be up to you which way uh, sort of works better. Then uh, if, a tra if, um, if an attachment was downloaded um, in the bank feed, it will show you right there. So some banks bring checks with, the positive, with uh, check images, and some banks bring uh, deposits with deposit images. Not very common, but it happens sometimes. And then the action button to add uh, you might see add, you might see match, or you might see transfer. Well, we're actually going to see all those things in action live. Okay. Now, let's say, for example, I only want to work on January. So what we probably want to do is I want to click on all dates, click on custom date range, and then type here 1123 to 13123. Click on apply, and I'm sort of just focused on January. I'm going to click on date to see all the transactions by date. Now, some of these descriptions look pretty clean, not a lot of extra graphics and stuff, uh, or extra symbols, I mean. This is because QuickBooks is actually using 
um, their own version of the description that's being cleaned up and organized for you. This is mostly done for like non-accountants that want to be less intimidated with the screen. So you want to click on this checkbox that says show bank details. And what it will do is it will change the description to actually fit exactly what downloaded, got downloaded from the bank. As an accountant, I much prefer that. For example, OnStar Data Plan and AT&T Cell Phone might be two different things. So it could be relevant to see the actual real bank description, what was downloaded from the bank. So again, we click on the gear menu and we click on show bank details. That's my preferred way of working. I'm going to turn off add new vendors because as I mentioned earlier, I actually don't like that feature uh, a lot. The actual vendors that you see on the screen now where it says payee, these were added through add vendors. So this actually, these vendor names are actually pretty clean. And for the most part in here, they match. Now, if they happen not to match, okay, uh, where for example, you have like Uber travel matching with Uber Eat or something like that, you can manually change that. Now, if you're ready to accept the transaction as is, you can just click on the add button. Okay, so this Apple, uh, apple.com slash bill being matched to pay Apple, that's correct. On categorized category, that's probably incorrect. Like on categorized expense is actually an account that QuickBooks Banking uses to put everything that it doesn't know what it is. So you can actually change that to whatever the correct category is by clicking on this, opening the transaction, and then clicking on the drop down menu and picking the right category. So Apple uh, or something you bought in the App Store, that could be software or something like that. So I'm gonna select software and apps. Now, if this happens to be a personal expense, you're gonna be looking at something like shareholder loan or shareholder equity or distributions or something like that, depending on how your chart of accounts is set up. So for all your personal, uh, for expense, for personal expenses, or owner distributions, you know, that's um, available there. In this case, I'm gonna use software and apps as a category. So I categorized it essentially once, and then I click on add. So once I uh, categorized it once, notice that next time you see Apple, it's now software and apps, just because I did it once, and now it shows in green. Green means QuickBooks is mimicking past behavior. It doesn't mean there's an actual rule. It's just mimicking past behavior. So just kind of letting you know, hey, by the way, um, we categorize this for you based on what you've done prior. There's no place in QuickBooks where you can see that. So that's a, sort of only sort of happening on the fly. Now I'm going to click on add one more time for the next Apple. And then once you use, once you categorize two things that are exactly the same and you don't have an explicit bank rule, it's gonna automatically prompt you if you wanna create a rule. It doesn't say the word rule anywhere on it. It just says, do you wanna use the same category for all expenses? If you click in yes, it's gonna expand and it's gonna open up essentially the uh, suggested rule screen where you can pick only a couple things. I can pick, uh, double check the payee. I already picked the category earlier. And then I can choose whether or not this is an automatically confirmed transaction or not. I'm going to hit no on this one. And then I have a couple options here. Don't show this again. If you click on that, you're going to disable this automatic pop-up. You won't disable rules in general. You disable this specific type of pop-up. If you click on edit rule, you're going to go to opening the, to create the rule from scratch screen, which we'll go back earlier. And if I click on create rule, it quickly creates the rule for you. Now I'm going to sort these by bank detail. So you can see all of these. Apple.com slash bill transactions, all of them are actually now categorized as software and an app. They're green, and they also have the little label that say rule in it. Rule means there's actually an explicit written rule confirmed by you, written by you, that's going to categorize this transaction for you. Now, the nifty thing about rules is that once rules are created and you're, you quickly review them and you're, and you're pretty much um, in agreement to how these transactions are being categorized, you can select a whole bunch of transactions at the same time by clicking on one, holding the shift key and clicking on the next one in the group, and you can accept them all in one shot.
Now, one thing you can do, I didn't accept those, but one thing I can do is I can go back and let's say, for example, this Uber Eats, there's an issue with this rule. Like it's actually uh, correctly picking a vendor for this Uber Eats transaction, but the rule is sending things to uncategorized. That's not correct. Or maybe that's what I'm guessing is not correct. So what I can do is I want to edit that rule. And the way I can edit the rule is down here where it says rule applied. It says Uber. When you click on that, it'll open up a rule on the drawer on the right-hand side, and it lets you edit that rule. And we're going to go back and talk about editing rules a little bit later or creating rules from scratch. But I'm going to quickly change this and move this into maybe travel or taxi or ride share. Actually, this was Uber Eats. So this would be uh, meals. Now, assuming that these meals have to do with travel or their business meals, that sort of thing, then I would put it into meals or meals with clients. Of course, if it's personal, you want to put it under distribution, uh, shareholder equity, shareholder loan, that sort of thing. And if you don't know what it is, you can leave it under uncategorized, and then you can go back and review your uncategorized um, transactions later with your client or whatever it is. Some people like to create an account called Ask Mike, Ask John, Ask Hector, Ask My Accountant. You can do that too. So if you, if, if you don't want, if you don't like the uncategorized um, uh, category, which I, you know, most accountants don't, then you can basically create your own quote uncategorized category. So I'm going to put this on the travel meals and then I'm going to click on save. Now, one thing that I don't like to ever do, so I'm going to point this out, is anytime you create a rule from the bank feeds workflow, QuickBooks will add the text from the memo of that specific transaction and it will put it under replace bank memo. That is a no-no. Never ever do that because you're gonna be overriding the original bank memo and that original bank memo is extremely relevant to double check your work afterwards. So what I want to do is I want to delete anything on the replace memo and leave it completely blank. That's what you want to do. Now, if you want to add something to the rule into the memo, so later on as you're reviewing the books, you know that this transaction was added by a rule. What you can do is you can add your memo. So let's say, for example, I'm going to do space hyphen space and then put hashtag added by rule or something like that so let's say i'm going to add some special internal code of mine you want to click where it says also keep bank memo what this will do is it will change it from replace to append and it will keep the original bank memo and then it'll add whatever extra stuff you want to add to that so if you want to search by that tag or by that spe specific text this is why I like using hashtag because it reminds me that it's something that I did it for the purpose of searching. Um, and I'm going to copy this and use it for other rules I create in the future. Um, I can do that. Now, you can automatically confirm transactions by doing auto add. I'm going to turn off auto add because I want to com uh, com um, continue discussing how this works. And then we'll talk about auto add a little bit later on. I'm going to click on save. So now you see um, that. When you look at all these rules, maybe they're, right, they're all in the right category. I can click on the filters here and then click on where it says recognized, or I can click on where it says uh, rule applied. The difference is rule applied will only show the ones that have rules, where the recognized will show the ones that have been recognized by previous behavior, which we'll cover shortly. So once you're pretty comfortable with um, the rules that you've created and the categories that there are, are out there, you can simply just quickly double check that these transactions are okay, click on select all, and then click on accept. And there you go. I'm going to remove the filter for rule applied, and then we see the transactions that we have left. So let's say this one for Audible is selected the right uh, vendor, payee name, and I'm going to put this into... Uh, maybe a new account called Research and Development. Okay, and I'm not making any um, specific statements as of uh, whether, you know, Audible is supposed to be Research and Development or not. 
Now, one thing that drives me crazy sometimes is that you'll type the account, and then once you come in here and change stuff, it will change it for you. So you kind of keep that in mind. You're going to click on detail type to select uh, the type of sort of uh, subcategory or not really a subcategory, but type of expense. So you pick the one that makes the most sense. If you can't find something that makes sense, just select other or other miscellaneous or something like that. And then we'll go back here and put um, research and development. Okay. Then I click on save and close. And then I click on add. Okay. Then I go to the next one and I say this one is a software and apps. Now, one thing that you will notice, and this is kind of an interesting thing, uh, when you select it to auto add vendors, it only auto adds a certain groups of vendors. There's other group of vendors that QuickBooks still kind of recognizes, and it will suggest down here to create um, a vendor name. So this is suggesting a Firefly with a Y at the end, even though the vendor name is actually Fireflies, plural, I-S, I-E-S dot A-I, technically not the same pay name. So if I click on Add Firefly, I could inadvertently essentially add the wrong vendor name. But you can get it started and just change it to whatever you want to change it. So it's a good starting point, I think. So we click on Add. I actually like that better than automatically creating the vendor for you. So we click on Add. Then the next one, this one didn't suggest a vendor name, so I can just copy it from the memo. Go here to Add New. Paste it. And then click on Save. And let's say this one's supposed to be dues and subscriptions. So I don't have that as an account. So I'm going to click on Add New Account. Click on the drop down. Select Expense. If I don't, there's dues and subscriptions, so I can create that on the fly. And then click on Add. So you're starting to see how we can do these things fairly quickly. Now, QuickBooks, for some reason, um, selected Research and Development from this one. Somehow, it thinks this is similar to Fireflies. I don't know how it did that. Mm, that might be wrong. Uh, the vendor name for this one is iFit. It's a fitness thing, so this is going to be personal. So I'm going to go to Add New, create, paste the vendor, click on Save, and then put this into, uh, is there a Distributions account? Yep, Distributions, there we go. And then click on Add. Then we have State Farm, which is going into Insurance. Sometimes you have multiple insurance, like car insurance, liability insurance. You could have maybe multiple insurance accounts or maybe sub-accounts. So you have to make sure you put it on the right one. So I'm going to put this under vehicle insurance. And did notice that it is suggesting things sort of on the fly, which is kind of interesting. If, you, if it doesn't suggest it for you, you can start typing VEH until you see vehicle insurance and then select it from there. Then we click on add. Then we have payment, thank you. Anytime you see a payment, this is actually a credit card. This is going to automatically choose instead of the categorized sort of type of transaction, it's going to choose either a transfer or a credit card payment. I'm okay with this once you're a more advanced user. The account here should be the bank account that you used to pay this credit card. So let's say I use this Chase 3000 account. So you may want to double check, go back into the bank account itself and make sure that was paid with that bank account bef uh, before you select this. Because once you create it as a credit card payment or a transfer, it's very difficult to edit after the fact. So anytime you deal with credit card payments and you're entering the payment from the credit card statement itself, then you want to make sure that you double check in that bank statement first to select the right account. If this happens to be paid by maybe somebody's personal account uh, and that personal account is not in QuickBooks and you have to put that into some sort of equity contribution account um, in there, okay? Under vendor, in this case, I'm just gonna put uh, Chase, okay? Because it's a Chase credit card. Okay, now notice you can only put the vendor name on the credit card payment. You can not put it on a transfer. A transfer and a credit card payment are the same type of transaction. The difference is credit card payment can only be created when it's originated from the bank, where, sorry, when originated from the credit card, 
where um, transfers can be originated from both a credit card and a bank and a bank account. Now, either one only allows you in the drop-down menu uh, to pick um, a, a, a balance sheet account. So uh, record a transfer allows you to pick any balance sheet account, including liability, assets, equity, where record as a credit card payment only allows you to select a bank account. So a small distinction on these two allows you to put a vendor name. So I'm going to click on add. And then on this last one, let's say this is um, software and apps. And then the vendor, I can actually copy it from the memo. This is why I like to have that memo in there. And then paste it in here and go to add new and save. Now, one thing I want to point out, if you don't select copy bank detail to memo, if you don't have that checkbox on, notice that the memo will be blank. And if the memo is blank, it could make it harder for you to review transactions once they are in the reports. So you want to make sure that those, uh, the original uh, bank text or the original bank detail, which is down here, gets copied over to the memo. You can modify that afterwards if you want to, but you want to make sure that's copied and then click on add. So notice we finished all the transactions from this specific um, credit card account for the month of January. And when I go back into my profit and loss and click on run report, now I see a whole bunch of different uh, categories in my profit and loss with all the transactions that we have entered. If I click on um, total expenses, for example, I get to see all the transactions in detail that I created from bank feeds. Notice that under description or memo, we get all the original bank memos because we had that checkbox in there, which is actually really good. It's actually what we wanted. And notice specifically with the Uber Eats, the ones that we created by a rule, it added or appended that additional information from the memo. So if you're looking at anything in, Quick, in QuickBooks in terms of detailed reports, and you want to quickly discern whether this transaction was added by a rule, an automatic rule, or something like that, then you might want to add those additional tags into your rules if that information is relevant. I mean, it's up to you whether or not you would find this useful. Now, I'm looking at, um, at a profit and loss report, which is only going to show me the transactions that were income or expenses. If I go back and look at the balance sheet, which will be slightly different, you're going to see the only transaction I entered for the bank, for example, which is a negative $16,000. This bank was blank at the very beginning. I'm going to do all dates here. And notice that there's the one payment that came from the bank. It's, actually, it's hitting the bank, and it was used to credit the credit card. So that's where the payment shows up. Okay, again, we still have not entered any transactions into um, the bank yet. Now, if we go down here into uh, the credit cards, notice we have our parent account, which, I, uh, which we've, um, we have in here, and all the transactions. And if I click on this 8300 account, if I click on that, I get to see, and I'm going to do all dates here, I get to see all the transactions that were entered. So all these transactions that were entered from uh, January are the ones that I just entered. And then this is, this is exa the exact example I was mentioning earlier. Notice that this uh, 315,000, that was from the, from the slides when I was mentioning to you that when you first connect the bank, it brings in this random opening balance equity. This is the stuff that I'm encouraging you, you to delete and clean up prior. So now you get to see all of the transactions that came in and then the payment uh, to the credit card, okay? Now, one thing to mention is you will never see, um, let me go back here for a second. When you see the payment uh, to the, the payment from the bank to the credit card, the 16,000, that's going to be, that's gonna look like a, like a single transfer. It's gonna look like a single um, credit card payment you're not going to see any breakdown of those expenses because not always when you pay a credit card, you're paying it in full, right? The pay, you can make multiple payments on a, 
on a, on a credit card account. You can make partial payments. You can make late payments. So the way QuickBooks separates it is the payment is an in independent transfer from a bank to a credit card, from an asset to a liability. And all the individual charges are always going to be inside each of the transactions. Now, if you go back into um, the balance sheet, and I'm going to click on the, the total balance here for the total Chase rewards, click on that, and then I limit the date range to, let's say, 20, uh, January of 2023. In the report, I'm going to see all the different sub-accounts broken down here so I can see all the transactions for this particular for this particular uh, sub account. So as I, as I go back and enter more transactions, you're gonna see them broken down in here. So I'll keep this report open um, so we can kind of see what, how, what that looks like. I'll go back into bank transactions here and I'm gonna switch over to another one of the sub accounts here. And we'll keep it on the same uh, date range here, that's fine. Let's categorize this one right here. I'm gonna copy the memo create the payee, okay, click on save, okay, so there was only one transaction under that sub account, let's go to this one, and we still have the same January only filter, let's grab a couple of these, let's see, let's sort this by bank detail, we'll grab all these United Airlines that are here, all these United Airlines are actually accurate. Like it's actually United Airlines airfare. So I select all these in one shot here and go to accept. It's an example of doing things in batch. I'm gonna say no for now for creating the rule. We'll go back to, to that earlier. I mean, uh, um, so, uh, soon. Let me go back into this report here and refresh it. And as the detail report for the credit card loads up, I'm gonna go back and do January 2023 one more time. Okay, notice I collapse this sub account, I collapse this sub account, I collapse this sub account. So we get to see very clearly all the activities out of each of the accounts. Okay, you see them all right there under each account. Now, what you're seeing here is the new reports. If you go to uh, classic view, and we do the same thing with the date ranges. I know not everybody is used to the new reports yet. So you wanna see it the way it looks like in the old reports, we can collapse each one as well. So you can see, or you can expand them and see all the transactions for each one. Now you don't have to group by account. If I go to none and click on run report, I basically see all the transactions for all the credit card accounts, for all the credit card sub accounts, and then I can just keep track as I see them in the account column. If I sort them by account column, so essentially I didn't, I chose not to group it, but to sort it in, instead, you can see the transactions sorted by that instead of just sorted by date or payee or whatever the original sorting was. Okay, let's go back into bank transactions. Let's do a couple more things here. So I'm gonna start working a little bit faster just to kind of show you, once you kind of get used to this, um, how much quicker you can work. There's 600 transactions, 636 transactions on this particular credit card. I'm trying to do all of 2023 in one shot. So we're gonna work a little bit faster. I'm not gonna limit the date ranges. And what I'll do is I'm gonna turn on grouping. Now I think grouping is one of the fastest ways to work in uh, QuickBooks Online because um, most of us are creatures of habits and our expenditure pretty much um, repeats itself. So to enter transactions in groups is gonna be much better and faster most of the times. So I'm gonna group these by bank details, the most typical thing that we'll do. And we start seeing how things are being entered in patterns. So for example, QuickBooks identified 7-Eleven as vehicle, gas, and fuel. This is probably accurate. So we're gonna select 
the group itself. So notice I clicked on the little checkbox next to the vendor name. Once I check out everything, it's okay. I just click on accept and do a more than one shot. Now I'm gonna start saying yes to creating the category. So I'm gonna click on yes, same category. I'm still gonna do no for auto confirm and then click on create rule. And then we see all the Airbnbs. They're being grouped together correctly, even though it says PayPal, Airbnb, and some random text. It's all being grouped correctly to Airbnb, just the category is incorrect. So I'm gonna select um, the category. I'm gonna put this into um, lodging. Do I have a lodging account? Maybe a hotel account? Hotels, okay, so I have travels, hotels. Save one, all the other ones are going to be shown in there. And again, that's um, the green is because those are, have been recognized. Now, earlier I talked about showing uh, rule applied versus recognized. If I click on rule apply, there's no transactions with rule applied yet. If I X out of that and I click on recognize, it will recognize the ones that have uh, patterns. See that? So this is from previous, um, from previous entries. Now I'm going to X out of that so I can show you something else. Let's look at another grouping. We'll look at Amazon here. So let's say Amazon is going to be office supplies. So office supplies. We'll save one. There we go. I'm not saving them yet. I'm just going to enter a couple here. Save one. There you go. Look at another grouping here. Now we have this BP of Florida, which is like sort of all over the place. So let's say this Florida kid care is uh, the business owner's sort of uh, insurance for their kids or something like that or, or personal insurance. So I'm going to create it, uh, BP Florida. Okay. It's probably Blue Cross Blue Shield or something like that. And then here I'm going to put it under distributions. Add. And then notice all the other ones, except for the last one for some strange reason, was uh, categorized like that. So we'll fix that one manually. So you have to be careful. Oh, don't always take the green stuff uh, for granted. I'm going to do, um, actually, I'm not going to do a rule for this one, just so I can show you. Okay. So I'm going to turn off the grouping. And I'm going to go back to date. So I see all the transactions in here. Um, there's one green here only. If I go back into my filter and pick uh, recognized, then I get to choose or I get to only see the transactions that are, have already been recognized by a previous pattern. So that's what that recognized uh, will do if there's no, if there is no uh, pattern. So, I mean, if there's no rule. So I could maybe select all these in one shot and then click on accept. So you're seeing multiple angles. You're seeing multiple angles or how you can do this. And again, we get, we get another pop-up for suggested rules for both of these. And at this time, you, I can do a create rule and create rule. Okay. Now I'm gonna go across to another account. Let's go to this account. And then I'm gonna click on the drop-down menu and click on rule applied. Notice that no, trans no transactions from, from this other account have been applied by a rule. Even though I do have a couple of rules I have created. If I go back into rules here, you see there is a couple of rules here. I find it strange that in my other credit cards, I didn't have American Airline, Airbnb, 7-Eleven, Apple, Stripe. Now that's all possible. But th the reason for that is because if you actually take a look at these rules, these rules when they're created, especially when they're suggested, they're limited to the specific account um, that, you, uh, that you created it from. So if you edit the rules and you change them from the specific account to all bank accounts, it is more likely that these rules will start catching uh, more transactions across multiple accounts. Unfortunately, this is a manual process when you create rules from the suggested workflow. That's just how QuickBooks does it. So all the rules from a suggested workflow are going to, um, are going to uh, uh, be created for the specific source account, which actually is a pretty good learning lesson because it lets you know that you actually have the control to have different rules for different accounts. Sometimes 
you know, an employee, is a, when an employee goes to, let's say, for example, an employee goes to eat at McDonald's, maybe you authorize them to eat on the job. But when the owner eats at McDonald's, maybe they're buying food for the kids. So the context could be different and the categorization could be different. So there's a lot of power there. So when I click here, I'm going to go to um, rule applied and see if any of the rules apply. And notice that now, this is the exact same account. Now the rules apply because I told it that the rules um, can expand multiple accounts. For example, you see these Apple transactions here. I'm going to show you one more time. This, I'm going to make these transactions disappear from Apple. I'm going to click here, go to the suggested rule for Apple, and they say that it's not all accounts. It's only, let's say, the 8300. Click on Save. And then when I refresh, the Apple transactions go away because they, the rule is not meant to catch Apple in this particular um, account. So again, if I want to clean that again, I go back into rules, edit that rule, and put all the accounts or the specific accounts that I want. Click on save, go to bank transactions, and it, it should catch, um, let's do rule apply. The Apple transaction should be back here. So pretty awesome, pretty amazing how powerful this rule system is. Now, notice that when I created these rules, I still have to review them here. I still have to select them um, and accept them, okay? So that's how rules work. Rule automatically categorizes something for you, and then it gives you the control to choose what you're going to do with them. Now, what you could do is, this is sort of over time, as you start getting comfortable with the rules, you can say, you know what? I don't need to review this anymore. These rules are working really well, exactly as designed. Let's have it automatically put things in QuickBooks for me. So I'm going to come in here, edit the rule, and then come down and click on Auto Add. When I select Auto Add or accept Auto Add, this is no longer going to ask me to accept the transaction. It's just going to push it into my GL. Now here's as I sign more, there's a really important piece, as I mentioned earlier. If you want to, um, if you want to add some sort of special tag, so I'm going to put auto rule, okay? And I'm going to click on also keep to append it. This will let me know that the transaction was added through an automatic rule. It's the only way through your reports by looking at the memo to quickly identify that. So most accountants freak out about automatically adding anything into the GL because most accountants want control, want to know what's going on in the process. Um, I'm actually more comfortable with auto add rules anytime I get to append a special note to that because I can always easily identify the transaction. And there's other ways to identify auto added transactions, but specifically through reports, which is the main mechanism that I use to review bookkeeping accounting. I like to append that in there. So that's kind of a free tip for me on that one. So we're going to click on save. Okay. Now when you do auto add like that, especially when it's, when it goes across multiple accounts, this thing is searching for 7-Eleven across multiple credit card, multiple bank accounts and a whole year. So it might take a little bit, a little bit longer to kind of go through and a whole bunch of transactions were entered. Okay. I'm going to go back and edit these rules and continue doing the same thing. So I'm going to make this an auto add. And again, I'm, I'm adding hashtag auto rule. Again, you, you decide what kind of hashtag you want. Click on save. And then on the next one, edit that. Append, paste my special text, auto add, and save. So as you do that, again, you're not going to see them anymore. In this case, across all bank accounts, because I, I told it to go back in all bank accounts, all credit card accounts, just automatically add those things in there. Now we'll go back to our profit and loss report. Go back and view our PL. And let's do all of last year. 
okay? Because we went across multiple months. And then you get to see that a lot more transactions were added. If you look at, for example, here on the software and apps, there's now $13,000 in there. If I click on that and I see the detail report, you get to see all the transactions that were added. If I expand on the description, you see the ones that say auto rule. So all these were created after I created the, 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 the special rule to be automatically added. And notice that some of these memos were different. This one says bill and this one says US. So they could be slightly different. Um, it doesn't get replaced. We just append the additional information that we wanted to add. Okay, let's go back into bank transactions. I'm gonna show you something else, which is I'm gonna click on where it says categorized. Now under categorized, we get to see all the transactions that we added through bank feeds. Notice here where it says rule, you get to see if it was added with a rule, the rule name, and whether or not it's an, it's an auto add rule. It makes it very easy to understand here. You can edit any of these rules straight from here. It's pretty neat. And you can actually manually edit any transaction. So for example, this one from Apple for $6,000, that's probably not software and apps. That's probably actual hardware. So that would go into a different category. Now I can either undo it um, and sort of send it back to, um, to recategorize. Or if I'm just doing a one-off, what I really should do is just open it, edit it, and then come in here and put it where it's supposed to go. So that we have um, equipment or something like that. Let's see, tools, machinery, and equipment. And then under description, maybe I'll add something like uh, brand new Max for the office. Now you can, of course, you can create your own, uh, at this point, your own fixed asset. If you want to use the existing one, I'm gonna remove auto add rule in this case because um, the little tag, because I actually manually changed it. So the context is, this no longer was something that was just added by QuickBooks. I actually changed it. I did something manual with it. Save and close. So just an example of something that you sort of changed um, on the fly, okay? It still shows up in here because it was originally added through, uh, through bank feeds. Let's go back for your review. Let's take a look at this one. It says uh, Marlins Mobile Payment. Let's say I went in there and click on Add, and I go back and go, oh, crap, that's not what I wanted. I wanted to do something else. So essentially, just go back to Categorized, if you can't find it, because there's a whole bunch of transactions, I can just type here, Marlin or something like that, if I can recognize it, and then click on Undo, sends it back for your review, and then I can put the proper uh, category here. So let's say I want to do it under Categorized, not under Transfers. I'm going to put here, um, let's put here Marlin's Tickets. Save as a vendor. <coughs> and then put the proper category. So let's say this is a personal account, a personal expense. So we'll put that under distributions. I'll remove here the memo. I'm going to put the original memo, which I copy and pasted there by mistake. Then click on add. And then I can either create the rule or not if I want to. Uh, notice a couple more transactions showed up under the same uh, similar name. Not, not exactly. I can select all. Now let's talk about some um, batching. I can, I can click on update. And then I can say, okay, this is Martin's tickets. And this is going to be uh, distributions. Okay. And then I can click on apply. And there's a difference between apply and accept. So apply will change them in this screen. Okay, and then I don't have to actually accept them yet. I can go back and accept them later. Or if I click on accept or under update, once I tell it what I want to do with it, I put the payee and the category, apply and accept, and it's the same thing as just clicking accept afterwards. I can create a rule for that, yes or no. And if this pop-up annoys you, just click on don't show this again the pop-up 
won't show anymore. However, you can turn that back on if you want to. Let me refresh the screen. You can turn that back on by clicking on the settings button and then clicking on show suggested rules. So when, when I have that off, I will no longer get the pop-up suggesting rules. Okay. Now notice that QuickBooks is suggesting some categories for me. Okay. Suggesting some things for me, even though there's no payees, it is suggesting things. Sometimes it's going to be way wrong. Like for example, this is a DDS, it's a dentist and it's categorizing it or suggesting inventory asset. Okay. Way wrong, of course. Um, then we have right tool being categorized as commission and fees. Then we have first watch, hot chicks, which is a chicken restaurant, <laughs> not a strip club. <laughs> Our chicken restaurant is going into meals. Uh, then we have Brower Center for tea. I don't know what that is, but it's putting it under meals. And we have all these things are all restaurants. Again, some of these are accurate. Um, uh, not This Broward Center for tea, I don't know what this is. This is not, probably not meals. Again, sometimes you could trust it, sometimes you don't. It's, it's a big challenge um, to work with these automatic categorized transactions because most non-accountants will come in here and just go, oh, this is beautiful. Accounting is easy. Select all and accept. And that's a big problem because just because you accept things in here doesn't mean they're accurate. Um, it's, sometimes it's sort of the battle that a lot of uh, um, accounting professionals have with, with their clients, you know, just not, not trusting for them to use um, uh, QuickBooks to do any sort of um, categorization or any sort of uh, work themselves. Um, and sometimes there's a misconception that coming in here and entering all the stuff and, um, and, uh, and, and just categorizing stuff. And then finally reconciling, which again, doesn't mean it's accurate, uh, it's eventually uh, correct. So when we click on the, on the gear menu here, there's an option that says, enable suggested categorization. If I uncheck that, okay, QuickBooks will still um, suggest some categories, but it won't suggest things based on past behavior. So I'm gonna show you what the difference is now. So I'm gonna click on, Enable suggested categorizations one more time. Then I'm going to sort this by bank detail. And then I'm going to start doing some of these things. So that's Adobe. This is going to be, let's say, uh, dues and subscriptions. And then I click on add. So now these things are green, right? Because this, this is the suggested categorization. If I click on the gear menu and uncheck enable suggested categorization and then refresh. Uh, you're no longer going to see the uh, category and match in green based on what we've done in the past. Now QuickBooks will suggest its own. So the black ones are the ones that QuickBooks suggests, and the green ones are the ones that QuickBooks suggests because of something you've done. So for example, this Amorino is being suggested as meals. But I'm going to go to one in particular and call it distributions. I'm going to call the vendor here, Amorino. Let's create the vendor. So I do one and then click on add. And it will continue to insist to make everything else meals because that's what QuickBooks originally was suggesting. And black will always be QuickBooks original suggestion. Whereas, again, if I click on the gear menu and click on show, I mean, sorry, enable suggested categorizations and I go back and refresh the screen, QuickBooks will suggest their stuff, but if you've done something else, uh, and we'll start kind of showing how that works here, let's do uh, dues and subscriptions. Uh, QuickBooks will start suggesting the green stuff based on your, bad, on your previous behavior. So it should be pretty clear what that green text and the black text means um, in context. Okay, all right. Let's talk about a couple of things here. Um, I'm actually gonna go down and look at a tricky type of vendor here. So I can use as an example. Go back and look at something that could be uh, slightly tricky. Okay, it's a good example. 
So we have we have a couple of vendors that all have cafe in it. Okay? There's Cafe Cafe, Cafe Blanc, Cafe Canela, Cafe La Regence. There's obviously four different restaurants. When I create my rules, I can create rules that are very specific or I can create rules that are pretty broad. So I'm going to go into rules here and I'm going to create a new rule and I'm going to call this cafe. Okay, just so you can start seeing some of the context of how this is going to work out. Then under here, I put whether there's money in or money out. So this is an expense, so that will be money out. And then I get to choose whether it's description or bank text. My suggestion is always use bank text because description is based on how QuickBooks renames the vendors, which isn't always uh, optimal, isn't always what you want. So you want to use bank text because it's the actual information that came from the bank. So I'm going to put here cafe. So it's going to grab everything that has the word cafe. And then under category, I'm going to put here meals. Let's do travel meals to be more specific. And then under payee, I'm going to create a generic cafe payee. This is not generally how I do it. I'm just doing it as an example. So I'm creating a payee called generic cafe, just to kind of just kind of show you. And we're picking up everything that has the word cafe in it. I'm going to go to assign more, make sure that this is blank. And I'm not going to auto add. And then I'm going to click on save. So I created a rule that essentially is a generic cafe rule. So once we come in here, I'm going to search for the word cafe in the search. And then we're going to see how the rule picked up everything that starts with the cafe, that has cafe somewhere in the middle of the name. So basically, it grabbed all my cafes and put them into the rule cafe. Now, something might be something wrong with this rule because the payee is supposed to show up here. Let me, um, let me click on this and edit this rule. I think I might not have selected the payee here. That's exactly what happened. So it didn't save for some reason. We'll go back and save. And we'll refresh this. You can refresh by doing the search again. Let's click on refresh. It's supposed to pick up the payee uh, cafe, which for some reason is not picking up. Let's see if, if we refresh, it picks it up now. Okay, there we go. So now I picked it up and put that on their generic cafe. I noticed that it, it's, it's picking it up at any point in time that it sees the word cafe. Now, I can, these rules, I can be very specific and go back into this rule. And then instead of doing contains, I can say, hey, it contains cafe or it doesn't contain cafe or it's exactly cafe. If I click is exactly cafe and then click on save, um, I have a feeling it won't pick many of them. Actually, it did pick up only the word cafe, cafe, which is, uh, this is kind of tricky. Not sure how I picked this one up. It's not exactly cafe, cafe. I guess. I guess um, because it's the exact same word, that's how I picked it up. But notice that it's just sort of very specific on how it, um, on how it picked it up, okay? Uh, so notice it didn't pick up anything else. Up, just pick up this one because it only contains the word cafe. So it's kind of interesting. So we'll go back in here and do contains. Now you can do multiple uh, rules, which is pretty interesting. So for example, I can say, hey, grab all the cafes and put them generically in here but if they're over a hundred dollars i want to see them differently or maybe if they're over a hundred dollars i want to create my own vendor for them okay so you can do that with the rules so I'll go back and create this rule here and then we're going to do multiple conditions so i'm going to do another condition which is amount and then we're going to put is less than a hundred dollars and then click on save so now you notice that it only picked up the rules for the ones that are under $100. And then the ones that are over $100, these maybe I want to manually do something else with them, put them in a different category, review them, attach a receipt, whatever you want to do. And this is kind of the neat part about rules is that you can, you can add multiple uh, things to it. Now, let's say, for example, mm, this one that has Ari in it, I want this to be uh, different as well. 
So I'm going to go back into my rules. I'm going to duplicate this rule. Copy it. And then I'm going to add one more condition. I'm going to remove the amount condition. I'm going to add one more condition where it contains the word Ari as well. And for the ones that contain Ari and Cafe, I'm actually going to use a different vendor called it Ari Cafe. So let's say I'm specifically identifying which vendor it is. And let's say I know that Ari Cafe is not for business. I know that's personal. So I want to categorize those differently. Then I'm going to click on Save. I do want you to notice, actually, I'm going to edit this one. And also, um, instead of call, calling it Copy of Cafe, I'm going to call it Ari Cafe. Now, I do want you to notice that these rules have priorities in them. Okay, so we have Rule 8 and Rule 9. And then when you actually see uh, these two rules here next to each other, they will take priority. So that means that the top, the generic cafe sort of rule will actually take precedence before the Ari Cafe rule. So go back into Bank Transactions. I'm going to search for cafe again. Notice that everything, even the Ari Bakery Cafe, is being undertaken under generic cafe. So it didn't respect the rule because of the priority. So if I go back into Rules and I move, change categories, I mean, uh, not categories, priorities, and I put Ari Cafe on the top, this rule will apply first before the ninth rule applies. So I go back into Banking Transactions, search Cafe, and you see how now it properly put them in here. Now it looks like it didn't catch the payee one more time, which we can fix that by editing the rule and making sure that it grabs it. Sometimes it's not very consistent at grabbing the payee when you create them on the fly. And then we'll go back and refresh the screen. And then we'll search cafe one more time. And now it picked it up properly. So let's say this is exactly what I wanted. Um, I can X out of the text search. I can just select the ones that are recognized. And then I can come in here, select all, and click on accept. Now I'm going to go back into my profit and loss for a second. Click on refresh. And then go open my travel meals. Okay. I'm going to click on the 449 there. And you see that a lot of these transactions are under the vendor generic cafe. But then when I go into description, I can see what the actual payee name was. So, I've, so this is why it's very important for you to maintain the integrity of the original payee names, especially when you go back and review something like this. Now, I always want to create a vendor name no matter what. Um, Generally, I will create a vendor for each one of these cafes. <coughs> Although it's pretty obvious from here that these are all sort of one-time use. So a lot of people argue, is it worth it uh, filling out my, my vendor list with a bunch of random pages that I would never use? And for that, I would tell you, I'm sort of on your side. I get it. I wouldn't want to have my vendor list clogged with a bunch of stuff. Problem is, if you do use them again in the future, you might not be able to um, use special reports to analyze them uh, better. So I'm going to show you that um, briefly. Let's go back into reports. So, and we're going to go to expenses by vendor summary. Okay. And then when you do expenses by vendor summary, I'm going to do all dates here. You get to see all the expenses that you've added and they're basically grouped by uh, payee name. You see on the generic cafe, again, we don't get the individual payee names um, because this is how we chose we wanted to do it. That's specific. That's exactly how we wanted to do it, right? So when we click on generic cafe here, then you can go in the report and then you can see the details. So it's really up to you and how you do that part. Okay. 
Let's go back into bank transactions. I'm gonna let's go back to bank transactions. I'm gonna get get back to uh, I'm gonna get out of a credit card, and then I'm gonna go into a bank account so we can discuss income. Income works uh, slightly different than expenses. So these are this is a bank um, account that has a transactions added in there. I, I'm gonna click on the filters and click on money in. And then I'm going to look at all the transactions in here, which is for money coming in. As you can tell, some of these are transfers from other bank accounts. And then we have, this is an example of a deposit here that we have for $725. So when I click on that, I can, um, I have a couple of choices. So one, I can choose my customer that paid me and then select the proper account category. Now, very important, you only do that if there isn't a invoice or a sales receipt that you're gonna match with that deposit. So only when we're entering income straight from deposits and we're not breaking it down by product, by service, or in this case, when you have lump sum deposits that contain um, potentially multiple um, uh, uh, checks from customers, um, then, then we'll do it this way. Uh, other, otherwise, you want to use a find match instead, which we're going to do a couple of examples of. So this is an example where you add income straight from, from here. Now, we have some money coming in that's coming from, let's say, transfers from, from other bank accounts. So when we deal with transfers, we take a look at the information that the bank gives us. So for example, this one says, it comes from account 5551. And then you need to determine if this is another business account that we need to transfer across multiple business accounts. If that's the case, you're gonna record tra as transfer. You create the other business account. So let's say this is Chase 5551. And then you do a transfer from account to account. Now you need to um, make sure that you, um, that you reconcile that account as well, okay? So we're gonna click on add as a transfer. That's giving a strange error, which I'm just gonna um, refresh here. Maybe they didn't catch it. Then we'll go back here and go to record as transfer, select the account, and then click on add. So now I caught it, okay? And I can do it all with the same type. Of <coughs> so I can search 5551. So these are the, all, all the other ones that have that and I can accept it as a transfer. Again, this is because I know for a fact this is coming from another business bank account. If it's coming from a personal bank account, then you might wanna put it in distributions or something like that. So we have a couple more examples of money coming in. Okay, in some cases, QuickBooks is detecting other transfers. In some cases, QuickBooks is suggesting um, to just hit the sales account. Again, as I mentioned earlier, if you're not gonna match these to uh, deposits, to payments, stuff like that, then you can just come in here, select your, your customer, select the income account, and then click on add, and that's it.